Conclusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your genes. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Richard Charlesworth diagnoses celiac disease. And from Halloween 2000, the secrets of making real zombies. First up, here's the news of carnivorous plants using gas to catch their prey. Fatal Attraction Researchers at the Jawaharlal Nehru Tropical Botanic Garden and Research Institute in Kerala, India, have found that the pitcher traps of Nepenthes plants release carbon dioxide gas to attract insects. The many species of Nepenthes hanging pitcher plants grow insect-catching traps along their vines that look like water jugs or drinking mugs, with a lid that's permanently tilted open. In some countries, they're called monkey cups. The traps have evolved from leaves to help the plants get the nutrients from insects that the plants can't get from the poor soils that they grow in. Insects feed on nectar on the lip of the trap and leave a trail on their return home to invite their friends. An ant trail results in hordes of ants following them. However, after rain, the lip becomes slippery and the insects fall in. They drown in a liquid at the bottom of the trap that's rich in digestive enzymes that break down the soft parts of the insect for the plant to absorb. Nepenthes grow some of the biggest traps amongst carnivorous plants. The biggest have been known to catch rats, lizards and small birds. Even the small ones can catch cockroaches. They grow in humid, warm, tropical places and they're observed to attract insects with splashes of colour, ultraviolet patterns, scents, and sweet edible nectar on the slippery lip of the cup or pitcher. Mosquitoes are able to find humans to bite by following the difference in concentration of carbon dioxide that we breathe out. They can zoom in on us, quite literally, by finding the higher concentration of carbon dioxide. The researchers found that in the same way, the Nepenthes traps streamed carbon dioxide gas into the air to attract insects. The researchers experimented with streaming plain air versus carbon dioxide-enriched air and found that the carbon dioxide-enriched air attracted more insects to the traps. They also found that the digestive enzyme fluid at the bottom of the pitcher was very rich in dissolved carbon dioxide, which made it acidic. The trap releases antifungal compounds into the fluid when it catches new insects, to stop itself getting infected. The trap grows as a hollow cup, with a tightly closed lid, inflating with carbon dioxide until the trap is mature, at which point the lid opens and the carbon dioxide starts to leak out, attracting insects. The trap keeps making and releasing carbon dioxide for the whole time that it's working to lure insects. The traps die in winter, to be replaced with new traps in the spring. The researchers found that the traps generate carbon dioxide as a result of using more energy to lure, trap and digest insects. Plants take oxygen in to make carbohydrate food for energy. The plants then consume this carbohydrate when they expend energy and give out carbon dioxide, just as we do. The higher levels of carbon dioxide may tranquilise the trapped insects, suggest the researchers, but perhaps that's just wishful thinking. The paper was published in Nature Scientific Reports and titled Nepenthes Pitchers are Carbon Dioxide Enriched Cavities. Emit Carbon Dioxide to Attract Prey. (music) 
You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Gluten intolerance. People who suffer from celiac disease can't digest the gluten protein in wheat and have a strong immune reaction that can cause nausea, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, stomach cramps and tiredness. Dr. Richard Charlesworth is a lecturer in biomedical science at the University of New England. Richard is studying different stages of celiac disease by measuring the way genes are expressed at different times in people living with the disease. I spoke to him over Skype and began by asking him, is there a spectrum of people with celiac disease? Absolutely. So there's a spectrum of celiac presentation that we see. So we have at one end of the scale very severe cases of celiac disease, and at the other end of the scale we have mild cases of celiac disease. And it's important when you diagnose these patients that you're able to place them accurately on that scale so you know the damage that they actually have to their intestine. And for people who aren't sure, what is celiac disease? So celiac disease is what we call an autoimmune enteropathy. So it's where your immune system starts to target your own tissues. So what happens in celiac disease is your immune system starts to recognize a very harmless dietary protein called gluten, and it starts to target this protein. So it recognizes it as foreign, it assigns it to be a dangerous protein, and it tries everything it can to get rid of that protein and it eventually destroys the cells in the small intestine that are involved in absorbing that protein. And what's the prevalence in society of people suffering from celiac disease? At the moment, the prevalence is actually increasing. So it's around 1% of the population have celiac disease. And in certain countries, that can be a lot higher. So in Finland and Scandinavia, Finland in particular, the proportion of people with celiac disease is around 2 or 3% of the population that actually have it. Do we have any idea why it is that gluten is triggering this immune response? We don't know. We know that with celiac disease, we inherit different genes that code for a certain immune receptor within our body, and that receptor binds gluten with very high affinity. So when these gluten epitopes, so these little fragments of gluten are generated, they bind to this receptor on the immune cells and it triggers this immune response to occur. But we, we simply don't know why that response actually happens yet. We just don't have that research as today. And how is celiac disease diagnosed at the moment? Currently, we use blood tests in the first line of diagnosis. So we look for certain markers, certain autoantibodies that are produced. If that comes back as positive and it comes back with high levels of those antibodies, we then look at the tissue itself. So you take a small amount of tissue from the small intestine and you look at that under the microscope and you basically look for the damage that actually occurs. And so what is your way of diagnosing that you've been working on? So with my form of diagnosis, we still take tissue from the small intestine, but instead of looking at it under the microscope, we look at the gene expression instead. So I've built a panel of genes, I have 80-something genes, and we look at the expression of all of those genes at once in the patient biopsy. Using that data, we can group patients into different classes of severity for their celiac disease. And how do you read the genes from the sample? Well, we basically just look at the gene expression. So we look at if these genes are upregulated, if they're downregulated, and just how much is actually happening. So one of our genes, for example, in celiac patients is upregulated about tenfold when you compare it to normal patients. So using that, that numerical value, we can start to actually classify our celiac patients. And the upregulation, is that from the levels of proteins that you measure in the samples? No, that's from the gene expression. So we're looking at mRNA levels. So as the actual genes are upregulated, we produce more messenger RNA, and that's what we're actually looking at with these genes. So you, you measure the regulation of the genes, the expression of the genes rather, and then mm -hmm. what, what do you do next? So from that, we use what's called discriminant analysis. So with that, we're able to actually take our numerical values for our gene expression and we build discriminant algorithms. So we're basically assigning a value to each patient 
by their gene expression. So it's a simple kind of XY coordinate system. So your X coordinate comes from a number of different cofactors that come from your gene expression. And you're able to actually plot these patients on a graph and you're able to put them in different groups over time. And what we can now do is actually measure the distance between certain groups and work out whether patients who are on treatment are actually progressing more towards a normal group or whether they're progressing away from the normal group. So we can gauge the amount of damage that's actually occurring. Other than just avoiding products with gluten, what treatments are there mm -hmm. for people suffering celiac disease? Currently, that is the only treatment that we have. There's a lot of other treatments in research at the moment. So there's a group in Melbourne who are working on a vaccine for celiac disease that's supposed to actually silence certain immune cells within the body. But currently, it is just a gluten-free diet is the best form of treatment that we have. But I think the only other thing that we've discovered with this test is the gene expression actually precedes the protein expression. So what we found is we can actually diagnose celiac disease a lot earlier than we thought was possible. So we saw changes in patients who appeared quite normal under the microscope, but genetically they had those markers for celiac disease. So they had the condition, but we just weren't able to see those changes at the tissue level just yet. So we were able to actually catch their disease presentation a few months in advance by using our technique. And you've presented hmm. your work at FameLab. I went to the New South Wales semi-finals, and the training that you receive at FameLab is fantastic. And I was lucky enough to progress to the national finals, where we had one of the trainers come out from the UK to teach us about science communication techniques. And it was really, really fun with a great group of people. So I'd highly recommend it to anyone who's considering actually doing it. Do you think you'll do a lot more public science communication? I think it's great to be able to share what you've learned with other people. So I'm really hoping to actually get into that in the future at some point. When you talk about celiac disease yeah. and gluten sensitivity, of course, there's that whole class of people who don't have celiac disease, but do feel yes. that they get sick or get bloated from having wheat yes. products. What have we found out? What we're sort of thinking is there's a spectrum of presentation again. So at one end of the scale, at one extreme, you have celiac disease. So you have patients that have this autoimmune condition and they have that particular reaction that occurs. But then we also have patients that have some sort of gluten sensitivity or some sort of gluten allergy. So they still react to the protein, but it's a different immune process that occurs. So they're still having some sort of reaction, but it's not celiac disease. It's a different allergic pathway that's activated. Then we have what we're calling gluten sensitivity. And gluten sensitivity is kind of, we're not 100% sure what's actually causing patients to have these symptoms. So there's no doubt that they're reacting to that particular protein, but we're not sure why they're reacting to gluten in particular. And the current thinking is there may actually be other proteins in the actual wheat grain itself, and they're reacting to those as opposed to the actual gluten molecule. So there's really kind of a spectrum of presentation. So that latter type of gluten sensitivity where it may not be gluten that they're sensitive to but something else is that covered by FODMAPs where people seem to be sensitive to these fructooglyosaccharides? There is a lot of thinking at the moment if there is some crossover between patients who have this gluten sensitivity and people who are following that particular FODMAP diet it's certainly helped to improve symptoms in patients with gluten sensitivity but of course, in patients with overt celiac disease, the low FODMAP diet will not make a difference. You have to remove gluten from the diet itself. So the truth is we're really not sure what's actually causing these symptoms to occur in those particular patients. And you had an interesting carnivorous plants. I do. I've grown carnivorous plants since I was about 15 years old. And there's a connection to celiac disease, if you've kept up with all Is the, there a the, connection Did you to not see disease? it? No, I haven't seen it. Oh, well, they've found an enzyme in Nepenthes that digests yeah. gluten. And they're suggesting it Fantastic. could be used as a supplement for people with celiac disease so they don't get symptoms. Interesting. I, I have a send giant Nepenthes growing in my kitchen at the moment, so I might be able to make use of that and see if it works. <laughs> Well, I'll send you the paper Fantastic. so you can see what it's what, which enzyme it's meant to be. Maybe you've got the equipment to, great, to sort yeah. it. That'd be great. I'd love to have a look. Because they do digest all sorts of things that fall in. 
but you wouldn't necessarily expect there to be a particular enzyme that would digest gluten residues because they're not really going to encounter them very much in the wild. No, but somebody thought to test it and that's what they found. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. I'll have to have a look. Sounds really interesting. Richard Charlesworth, thank you very much. That's all right. Thank you for having me. That was Richard Charlesworth from the University of New England talking about the expression of genes in celiac disease. And finally, learning the secrets of making real zombies. <laughs> Zombies, the walking dead, are empty shells of men. Automatons with no inner life at all. Corpses raised from the dead to be slaves to their voodoo master. In Hollywood movies, they're creatures to be afraid of, who come seeking brains to eat. Undead monsters that cannot be reasoned with or fought. In pubs, a zombie is a drink made from light rum, Jamaica rum, apricot-flavoured brandy, pineapple juice, lime juice, orange juice, passion fruit juice, and powdered sugar over crushed ice. In Haiti, they know that zombies are not to be taken lightly. Although they do not fear the zombies themselves, they fear becoming zombies. The word zombie is derived from the Congo word zombi, which means spirit of a dead person. The first references to zombies were discovered in Haiti, a tiny Caribbean island that won its independence from French slavers in 1804 and began creating its own unique culture and way of life, heavily influenced by the African Dharmini religion of many gods, and the pretense of Catholicism that it hid under when waves of missionaries tried to crush their religion. Haitians believe that relatives or friends who have sufficiently annoyed others are in danger of being turned into zombies. A Bokor Voodon sorcerer is believed to reanimate a freshly buried corpse of such a person. To make sure this doesn't happen, relatives attend the funeral and stab the body in the heart or remove the head. This second death ensures that the soul is truly gone and the body can never rise again. Zombie slaves can be spotted by their curious lurching walk, swaying side to side, their eyes are glazed and they have nasal voices. The nasal voice is attributed to the voodoo god Baron Summerday, lord of the burial grounds. A zombie who tastes salt or meat becomes conscious again and is released from the Boko's control to return to his grave. In 1912, Stephen Bonsall wrote an account of a man he saw buried being found in his grave clothes several days later, moaning inarticulate words and recognising none of those who could identify him, such as his wife and the doctor who pronounced him dead. In 1959, Francis Huxley reported on a zombie discovered wandering a Haitian village street and recognised by a woman as her nephew who'd been buried four years earlier. In spring 1962, Clavius Narcisse died at the Albert Schweitzer Hospital in Des Chapelles, Haiti. His death was verified by the hospital staff. Eighteen years later, Narcisse turned up alive and well and claimed to be an escaped zombie. As recently as 1993, André Ville Jean-Paul gathered crowns to tell of how he was buried alive and resurrected as one of the living dead. This was a serious matter for the authorities because zombification was outlawed officially in 1989 with a life sentence. And also because of the political aspects. Voudon was behind the successful revolt against the French slavers. He said he was in a coffin for two weeks and then put to work in the rice fields with 18 other zombies. Anthropologist Wade Davies went to Haiti and uncovered that zombies are the result of an interplay between social rules imposed by a secret Voudon government of Bizango sorcerer societies and the use of powerful drugs. The drugs that can make a man seem to be dead and then revive him are naturally worth a great deal to the science of anaesthesia and to drug companies. 
The powder is able to be absorbed straight through the skin, so the bokor needs only to sprinkle it on the floor or blow it into your face. Davies bought the zombie making powder from a bokor and obtained the full ingredient list and magical process. To make zombie powder, you need human flesh and bone, a toad made more poisonous by scaring it with a stinging worm, a poisonous centipede, a particular species of spider, several psychoactive herbs such as Damiana and Datura, and a puffer fish. All of the ingredients are psychoactive and toxic, with the exception of the human meat, but the interesting one is the puffer fish, which makes a poison called tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin is a sodium channel blocker that disrupts communication in brain cells. The puffer fish is the source of the Japanese delicacy fugu, where the deadly poison sacs are removed before eating. Trace remains of the drug give Japanese diners a euphoric buzz. More than a trace will kill you. The symptoms of tetrodotoxin poisoning appear quickly. Slight numbness of the lips and tongue, feelings of floating, headache, rapid pulse, nausea, trouble walking, trouble speaking, trouble breathing, paralysis, then coma or death. The coma gives the full appearance of death good enough to fool many doctors. Of course, this raises the question of whether those people who died of pufferfish poisoning should really have been buried. But I'll leave that one to your imagination. The toxin is not only used by the pufferfish, but also the Australian blue-ringed octopus, Australian Zantides crab, the Tericha salamander from California, and marine bacteria in the North Sea. The victim in a tetrodotoxin coma may in fact still be conscious and awake because of the parts of the brain that are left untouched by the drug. So the victim will hear his own funeral and be aware of his own burial. Naturally, when he's dug up by the bokor, if he's lucky, he's awake and traumatised and willing to believe he's been reanimated. He's then drugged again with Datura, known as Zombie Cucumber, and kept a suggestible and biddable slave with Ciguatoxin. Ciguatoxin also causes Ciguatera. Timothy Leary showed that psychoactive drug effects are determined by the expectations of both the subject taking the drugs, the people around them, and the society they live in. In a religion that grew out of a rebellion against slavery, it's no wonder that this means of social control is so effective. So, are you safe from becoming a zombie if you stay out of Haiti and avoid the poisonous animals? When you turned on the radio or the podcast, you probably thought that you yourself did it. That is, the conscious being that is the sum of your experiences, thoughts and dreams. The self that thinks. Therefore it is. The self that you know lives in your head, just behind your eyes. But you yourself didn't turn on your radio or play the podcast or reach out to pick up a cup a few moments ago. The zombie did. The zombie is a metaphor being used by psychologists and neuroscientists to capture a strange division in our minds. The division is between what your conscious self sees, smells and hears as you go about your daily life and what your brain and body unconsciously register is out there and needs dealing with. The two are not always the same. By the time you notice a spider in the bath, it should be obvious that your unconscious brain and body, alias the zombie, have already seen it and begun to flinch. And by the time your conscious self realises that you're blushing, sneering or giggling inappropriately at a cocktail party, it's too late to preserve your dignity. The zombie within let loose the emotion without consulting you yourself. Yet reflex reactions and hair-trigger emotions are merely the flashier of its talents. As psychologists and neuroscientists probe the mind more deeply, they're uncovering evidence of subtler unconscious perceptions and abilities of which science has only been dimly aware until now. Even now, unconscious circuits of the brain are processing sensory information that you yourself know nothing about and initiating little movements on the sly. Some patients lose the ability to recognise faces, for example, yet their brains and bodies still produce the physical signs of emotions when experimenters show them photographs of their loved ones. 
a sure sign that the zombie recognises the faces, even though the self does not. Similarly, amnesiacs may not remember that just an hour ago an experimenter held up a board with a simple word like cotton written on it. Yet when asked to fill in the blanks in C-O-T dot dot dot, the same individuals will unthinkingly mouth the word. Ever notice how sometimes you just find yourself doing the right thing? Researchers measuring brain waves have found that the signals to move muscles are often initiated before the signals have time to be processed by the conscious mind. Yet we rationalise our automatic behaviour and remember having made a conscious decision to act. While the Vudon sorcerers in Haiti control society through people's fear of becoming a zombie, neuroscientists may discover that it's all too late. <laughs> And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. Sound check and fact checking by Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8 C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambucca Valley, 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, 7LTN City Park Radio in Launceston, Tasmania, and my local station 2RDJ in Burwood, New South Wales. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 Internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 950 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick, everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.